All right, Mr. Rocky Wattis, thank you very much for coming on to the BoxingBar.com, man, and welcome. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Question one, where were you born and raised? Well, I was born in 1980, uh, April 15, 1980, in Houston, Texas. Correct me if I'm wrong. You're like the only boxer, I believe, that by record, by birth certificate, your real name is Rocky, not like Rocky Marciano, Graciano, Balboa, or even Rocky the wrestler. You know, you're like the original Rocky. Uh, well, I don't want to say the original, but I mean, I was, uh, Rocky is in my birth certificate, and uh, it was a birth-given name. And why was that? What, was some boxing plugged there somehow, you know, through your family or through your parents? Well, I don't want to say that. I, well, my, I know my grandfather happened to be the only fighter, from what I know, coming out of my uh, my father's side. And he happened to uh, basically kind of teach me the basics when I was a, a young kid. Uh, but besides that, I mean, I never really thought I was going to take up boxing. I mean, I would fight in the streets and stuff like that. But I think the sport that we, uh, my whole family uh, played was uh, baseball. It just happened to be that when I got into boxing, I preferred the uh, feeling of winning in a single individual sport that I just had to uh, continue doing it. Was it the streets that, you know, got you into boxing or into fighting? Was it one day that you just by chance happened to go into the gym? I mean, how did that fall into your life? Well, when I took up boxing, I was 12 years old. Um, my grandfather actually took me to my first boxing gym at the age of nine. But, you know, the coach didn't pay much mind to me. And at that time, at at, at nine years old, I think I had preferred playing baseball at the time. So I, I, I stopped boxing after one month. But you know, the crazy thing is that here in my neighborhood, the kids that actually grew up on the block, we would always put the boxing gloves on against each other and just tell each other, well, we'll go against you and you, know, you, you versus you. And it's just, we would just put them on and uh, you know, fight against each other. So you go into the gym for the first time, but I mean, what was that uh, feeling like or what were your feelings while you were in that gym? Basically, was learning the basics. You know, my, my my grandfather taught me the basics of, basics of boxing, but, you know, it's different. You know, you have to actually be in the boxing gym, kind of see what, what goes on in the gym and, you know, spar and, and actually fight against somebody that actually knows what they're doing, you know. That changes you a different aspect, you know. That was something that I could always do, you know. As far as boxing, eh, I was rough, but you could see that I had the ability to adapt very fast and, um, uh, you know, like when I first when I got back into the gym at the age of twelve, I joined a uh, near boxing gym right here where where I live by, Ray's Boxing Gym. And I remember going to the gym on a Monday, and by Wednesday he had already had me sparring for the first time. Did it come naturally to you? Was it something that you had to really work hard at to actually get good? I mean, what was that first experience like getting in there to, to spar for the first time? Well, I always knew how to fight. I tell people you can teach somebody how to box, but if they don't know how to fight, they're in trouble. I think I always knew how to fight. So it's just basically kind of learning the basics of boxing and combining both fighting and boxing together to uh, progress. And progressing is pretty hard, especially when you're a young kid and you have to give up eating you know, all the candies that you probably want to eat or all the foods you want to eat or you know, go out and uh, hang out with all your friends and your buddies or have girlfriends. You have to pretty much sacrifice a lot of that when you're a kid growing up to you know, develop yourself as a, as a young man in that ring. Was it pretty hard for you to do all that or sacrifice all that oh, when, when you were a kid? Oh, yeah. Yeah, definitely, man. It's, it, any fighter who, who makes it to a, a top level, you know, national champions, uh, making a state, even those that sometimes don't even make it, you know, some boxing is a tough sport. And I tell anybody, any kid that actually wants to do it, that uh, it's going to take a lot of their time. It's going to take a lot of sacrifice, hard work to basically be good at it. I mean, you can have all the talent in the world, but if you don't dedicate yourself and work hard in the gym, you know, you will never succeed and be the best uh, at the sport. So many, uh, Mexican-American fighters, when I ask them this question, you know, what was it like for their parents or what did they think of them getting into boxing? And everybody always has a different answer. But, I mean, what, what was it like for you, you know, having your parents know that their kid is getting into a sport like this? Well, my father was a big drive in, in me. You know, my father, was a, he pushed me hard and he was very hard on me. You know, and, and that was in anything, you know, whether it was just working, cleaning outside or anything. You know, my father always taught me that you know, if you're going to do something, to be the best at it. And uh, I remember when I first started fighting, my father told me that if I'm not going to go out there and, and do what I'm supposed to do to, to uh, better myself, then, you know, just not fight at all. I remember one time growing up as a kid, I actually kind of wanted to quit. I said, I don't want to box no more, Dad. He goes, oh, well, okay, that's fine. And then I told him, I said, you know, I don't want to go to school anymore. Oh, you don't want to go to school? Okay, that's fine. And I'm thinking, oh, okay, shit, everything's good. So when I uh, went to sleep that night, woke 
The next morning, my father grabbed a glass of water and threw it dead in my face, woke me up with a glass of water to my face. And, of course, you know, you, if you've never had that happen to you, I mean, you wake up like, what the hell is going on here, you know? And uh, he told me, he goes, andale, cabrón, you know, vamos a ir a trabajar, which basically means, you know, keep your ass up, just go to work. And he took me to work. I missed school the whole day. That's called tough Latino yeah. love right there, right? Oh, yeah, man, you know. And I tell you what, man, I always knew my dad was a, a hard worker. And, you know, when I went to work with him, and he would always take me to work at times, you know, just, you know, as the runner, you know, go get me this, go get me that, clean this, clean that. And uh, I remember when he when he did that, I I said to him, I said, Dad, I don't want to I don't want to work, I want to box. So he said, well, All right then, we'll get you butt back to the gym then. And then I I went back to the gym the next day. Back then, you know, when you were a teenager and hitting bags and sparring and going to the gym every day, what types of things came to your mind while you were hitting a bag and you know to make you run that extra mile? What type of things did you put in your head to motivate you? Well, my grandfather was a big motivation. You know, my grandfather was the only other fighter in my family. My father didn't box. He loved to watch boxing. But my grandfather was uh, a fighter when, when he was a young man. And uh, I remember coming home from school even before I took up boxing. You know, walking home from school and my grandfather happened to be outside every day, you know, doing something, you know. You know, typical Mexican, uh, a Mexican uh, worker, he's outside doing something, you know. You don't know what he's doing, but he, he has to be doing something. And I remember walking home from school, and he would always basically tell me, you know, you know, you know, come here, you know, and he would put his hands up and tell me, uh, okay, you know, work these combinations, he would, and and I would hit his hands as if they were mitts, and I, and I used to listen. That was the one thing because my grandfather used to do that with all my cousins and my brothers and basically everybody in the family, just trying to teach everybody how to stuff defend themselves. And it just so happened that I was the one that I, that actually like really really listened. And being in the sport by that time, by your teen years and your amateur years, I'm sure you were watching professional boxing yourself. What guys did you look up to? What guys, you know, got you going whenever you saw them in the ring or on TV? Well, I was always intrigued by boxing, you know. A lot of kids at my, well, let's just say at the age of eight, nine years old, I have a 10-year-old, you know, and I can put him in front of the TV while, while a fight is on, and he won't show no interest in watching it. And I remember as a kid, I always had, I was always intrigued by by boxing. And I always love to watch fighters like Julio Cesar Chavez, uh, Mike Tyson, Arturo Gatti. Um, and I remember these fights uh, very well, you know, where I was at and uh, not even fighting at the time, not even boxing, taking up boxing. But I remember uh, just being intrigued by the, the sport and it was just something that I enjoyed watching. He had over 150 fights like 145 wins, uh, more or less, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but, you know, around that, um, you start getting into the deep waters here. You start going towards, you know, the Olympics and, and, and doing all those, you know, uh, trials for that. You know, what what was that like once you got to the finals to go on to the U.S. team, that victory where you won to go on to the Olympic team? What was that like for you? Well, at that time, I, had, I hadn't suffered a loss in, in quite a while. I mean, I guess from the year of 98, for, for two years, I was just, I didn't lose a fight. I mean, I believe it was about 68 consecutive victories leading up to the uh, to the finals in the Olympics. I remember fighting in a tournament. I fought a kid by the name of, uh, either it was Tiger Allen or Rock Allen. I know they're brothers, identical twins. And um, I remember fighting them, and I was intimidated by Rock or Tiger Allen. I was intimidated by them because they were young and strong, and everybody would talk about all these kids are coming up, and they're they're, they're bad. They're bad boys. So I remember fighting him, and I said to myself, I allowed the height to get to me. And when I fought him, I held back just a little bit, just enough to where he defeated me. And I remember I told myself I would have never, I would never allow that to happen to me again. And I did so. I said, every fight I go in, I'm going to fight 110%. You can never go wrong. From that fight on, I had won 68 consecutive victories in a row. You know, I just wish, hey, I just wish I had, I took that with me in the pros as well. You got a gold in the World Amateur Championship, and that was in Houston, I believe, right? Yeah, that was actually here in my hometown. Robert Garcia is well known here in Oxnard. Uh, his first world champion is Steve Luevano, and you beat him in uh, the United States Amateur, I think, Featherweight Championships, right? Yeah, Steve Luevano, I believe I beat him like two or three times as an amateur. Um, I remember beating him in the Nationals. I had beat him in the uh, Olympic box-offs, but... Uh, Luevano was always my biggest, uh, toughest match because him being a southpaw tall 
and he had decent power. People underestimated uh, Luevano's power, but he was very crafty, I could say. You go on to, you know, the the 2000 Olympics, and you know you're going to be representing the United States in the Olympics. I mean, what was that like for you, for your family, for your friends, for your fans? I mean, what was it like there in Houston, man? It was great. It, it, I mean, it was great. I mean, when I won the World Championships, I don't believe that was a uh, that didn't put me in the uh, Olympics yet. I still had to win the box offs and also the uh, American qualifier or something like that. So where I had to fight, I had to fight Colombia, Puerto Rico, uh, Mexico. And uh, I fought another country, but that was actually the tournament that put me in the uh, the spot rep- to represent my my country. Once you got to Sydney, man, what was it like for for you that experience being there, knowing that you're going to be going in there uh, fighting at this dream tournament, you know, at well, the Olympics know, for the United States? What was that like, man? You know, you know, making the Olympic team was never really a dream for me. Um, you know, to me, being in Sydney, Australia. I had already went to uh, the World Championships right in in '97. I had went to the World Championships as well, representing the United States, and that was in Budapest, Hungary. I was the youngest guy on the team, but it was it was all the same. You know, it was just to me another tournament, and uh, I didn't really think of it as you know this is the Olympics and the biggest stage of my my career as an amateur at that time. I just looked at it as another tournament, and I had to go in there and do the best I can and and win. You didn't feel any of that added pressure. No, I mean, I don't. I, I, from what I recall, from what I remember, being in the Olympics, we we all knew as a team, you know, because we would talk about it. Um, I remember talking to Ricardo Williams Jr. We would talk, uh, Clarence Vincent, and basically everybody knew that this was our our opportunity to sh- to shine, and if we were planning on going pro, and I knew I was planning on going pro after I made after the Olympics. So de- determining whether or not we won gold or silver or bronze or or not even meddling determine on how we were going to be get, getting picked by the scouts i like to call them you know the promoters so i knew i had to go out there and perform the best of my ability to to show the promoters the scouts that i was uh you were for real i was for real you know to go into the pros and you you didn't just try but you got all the way to the end man uh you ended up fighting a, a guy from kasaka fam uh beck sat no. sat enough and uh no. He ended up, I guess, holding a lot. It was a very controversial uh, fight. I remember that. And there was a lot of holding. And next thing you know, you, you lost a decision there. And it, it was very controversial, man. What was that like to lose that opportunity to win gold? You won silver, but to actually, uh, you know, get that stolen from you. Well, you know, it, it, it was very disappointing, man. I, I, I can tell you that. I remember being, I remember like it was yesterday. I remember being at on the podium, you know, second place, looking down, crying. Uh, upset, um, just upset that I, you know, I, I didn't win the gold because I knew I had worked so hard to get to that spot. You know, I, I didn't even really blame the judge at that time. I remember thinking to myself, you know, you don't think about it. I mean, yeah, I know the judge was in favor of the fighter I fought, and the guy held and was holding the whole, just about the whole third and fourth round, but I remember just thinking that I let my country down, you know. That I was seeing another flag being risen up over the uh, American flag. You know, you don't, how can I say, uh, I'm a Mexican-American. I was born here in the United States. You know, my family's from Mexico. But uh, when you actually go and you compete uh, representing your country, it really becomes a a sense of pride and honor. And when I lost, I mean, that's what it was. It was like I I felt like I I let my country down. Would you say leaving the amateur style and going into the professionals, would you say, did you feel like maybe your style and how you fought was more suited for the pros and the amateurs at that point when you were still like in the Olympics? Oh, definitely. I mean, I was a body puncher. I had always been a body puncher. You know, I I was always a body puncher from the time I I took up boxing. You know, my grandfather and, you know, being, being from Mexico, Mexicans always throw body shots. And he used to always tell me, you go to the body, go to the body, go to the body. You hit the body, the head will fall. And I always had a good left hook. And la gancho, la gancho. And he would always tell me, throw the gancho, throw the hook, throw the hook. And I would always go to the body, create a opening. If the guy was blocking his body, go to the head. He's blocking the head, go to the body, mix it up. 
And I don't know if you ever see like the posts I do online and stuff like that, but you know I'm always posting on those Mexican fighters like Vicente Saldivar, uh, Raúl uh, Raton Macias, uh, Ruben Olivares, Salvador Sanchez, all the way down to Chavez and everybody else. They were all potty punchers, man. And you know you're exactly right. And I'm sure your grandpa took it from there. Oh yeah, I mean, I mean, any Mexican, it's just we throw body shots, you know. You know, if you're born in Mexico or you're if you're trained by a Mexican fighter, they're gonna make you go to the body. And your first pro fight, man, it was nationally televised. I remember seeing that on Showtime, I believe. You were a showcase there. Juan Diaz was showcase there. Even a Mexican uh, Olympic uh, a fighter, uh, Panchito Mojado, and I posted his, I think, online through YouTube. Right. I posted his fight on there. But, um, you know, you guys fight over in Connecticut. You guys are there in the locker room before your pro fight, man. You know, what were you thinking uh, back there in the locker room before going out through the drapes that day, you know, knowing that, you were, you were going to have smaller gloves. Your hands were going to fly a lot faster, but you were going to receive harder punches. You weren't going to have the shirt on. You were going to have the headgear on and all that other stuff. What was it like for you, man, thinking of all that stuff oh, before man, going through the drapes the first it, night? It, it, uh, I was very nervous, very nervous, you know? you know. I happened to be the guy, one out of the two American fighters who won a silver medal. Nobody had won a gold medal that year of 2000 Olympics in the United States. But I, happened, I was one of the the two uh, silver medal guys and you know I was I was supposed to come out and show out and I remember putting on these eight ounce gloves Reyes I've always wore Reyes I think I probably wore maybe Everlast gloves maybe two fights out of my career and uh, I remember having these Reyes gloves on and I said I was waiting for my coach to put my headgear on I'm thinking holy shit I, don't, I ain't gonna wear no headgear and I had to punch myself a couple of times and when I punched myself I said oh damn I'm hitting myself too damn hard I said, I better not get hit by my opponent. So it, it, there was a lot of nerves going on, uh, going into uh, my first professional fight. But I was excited at the same time. You know, I knew I had to, I had worked very hard in the gym. So a lot of times, a fighter, man, if you, when they know they put in the work, you know, they they go in there with that confidence of, you know, the only way I'm going to get beat is if the guy's better than me or if I get caught by a lucky shot. And after that first performance, uh, after the four rounds, and you finish up that, that first fight there. Did you say to yourself, like, man, what am I getting myself into? Or did you know things were only going to get better from here? Well, you know, my first fight, I didn't look very impressive. And I remember after that fight, I had uh, I had received a lot of criticism on my first pro fight. You know, going into that first fight, people don't realize I fought an undefeated guy, I think, with the record of 2-0 and or 3-0. and And was southpaw at that. We, we went in there thinking the guy was right-handed. The guy happened to come out southpaw. I'm thinking, okay, he's just trying to fool me, and then he's going to fight a conventional stance. But he never changed the whole fight, and I'm thinking, what the hell is going on here? You know, I'm supposed to be fighting a damn right-handed fighter. After the fight, they happened to tell me that the guy said he was right-handed, but he just he was always taught how to fight left-handed. And that's why there was a mistake in, in my matchmaker at the time. We thought he was right-handed, but he was right-handed, but he just fought left-handed his whole career. So it caught me by surprise, you know. So it was, I was just having to adapt to it. You won by a unanimous decision there in the fourth round. After that, it seemed like you were just racking up. The the power was just starting to show. You You seemed like you were knocking everybody out after that. Well, even as an amateur, I was knocking guys out. I mean, either I was hitting them to the body, knocking them out, to, or dropping them with body shots or, or to the head. So I, I was always confident with my power. But as an amateur, you know, you, you're, you're taught to win fights by points not so much by power. So it was a, it was a matter of adapting to a, the pro style. And I remember after that first pro fight, uh, having a lot of criticism, it made me very upset and made me want to show that, you know, because I think Monchito Bojado, he, he was the big talk at the time. And everybody was talking about, you know, because he, he had knocked out his guy. And it happened to be till about my fourth or between my fourth and eighth fight where I started being like, okay, well, Rocky Waters, he's, he's the bread and butter of the team. You know, but all the, all, everybody was coming out looking good. You know, Jeff Lacey was knocking everybody out. Uh, Panchito Rojado was also, you know, still winning in impressive fashion. But, uh, you know, I just had my own uh, particular style. The longer, the longer the fight went, the better it suited for me. You know, you, you brought up like that you had a, like a lot of critics. Was that like a big factor, man? Did you feel extra pressure because of all this Olympic, you know, fame that you had got? Did that hurt somebody? You know, coming out of the Olympics with all that added pressure, I mean, what was that hard for you personally? Well, that comes out. That comes with the territory, you know. I mean, 
it can be fuel to the fire, but at the same time, it can also be like, you know, why are these guys talking about me? Why, you know, you question why are these people that don't even know you writing negative stuff about you? You know, when you're busting your butt in the gym every day and trying to give the fans the best fight possible. But, you know, that's me being young, you know, and that's something that takes time to, uh, to be able to get used to and, and, and adapt to. I mean, it just comes with the territory, so I mean, I, I'm not going to knock it. What was your lifestyle like at that time, let's say your first, you know, dozen fights? I mean, what, was it hard for you to be disciplined because you were kind of like in a celebrity status, especially like your area in Texas? You know, what, were, was it hard to stay away from, you know, let's say partying or, or uh, you know, all this fame and, and stuff that was going on, you know, with you personally? Was it pretty hard to adapt to, you know, the outside life aside from all the ring stuff? Well, you know, it, it, yeah, it's very hard. So a lot of these young guys that are coming up that, man, they need to stay motivated. They have to keep their head straight because, you know, my first professional fight, here it is, I'm just a kid from the neighborhood making $100,000 his first professional fight on a full round fight. And, you know, you don't realize the life change it is, but you got this money and you're like, you don't know what to do with it. So, of course, you have a lot of, uh, moochers, I like to call them, a lot of new friends, a lot of people that come around and, um, uh, Family. Yeah, hang around and leeches and all that stuff. Yeah, yeah, even even family that 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 you know, you know, want money or you know, uh, family that are coming out of the woodworks that you've never met in your life and that that come to you and say, hey, you know, I'm your cousin, I'm your you no, know, I'm your daddy's cousin, sister's brother, and you're like, what the hell? <laughs> okay, but uh, if anything, man, I'm, it, it is tough because at the time I, I never had went out, I didn't drink, I didn't party, I didn't do any of that um, leading up to the Olympics. Now, all that actually started to come out once I turned pro. But I remember uh, even in my four-round fights, it, it wasn't difficult, but, you know, life does change. I remember uh, if, if I did go out and I did drink, you know, being a young man, never seeing the lights of a club and uh, the women, then the women come too with that. It, it changes, you know. But I think I can say that I was very disciplined, you know. I would say when I was fighting four round fights, I didn't drink at least one month before a fight. Um, I always knew when I was scheduled to fight because, of course, I was a big investment to uh, my promoters. So they would tell me ahead of time when I, I was fighting. And I always train hard. I mean, I think that I think that's probably why my career lasted so long because I was always a hard worker in the gym. I always busted my butt and, and stayed focused. You have some nice wins, man, against guys like Hector Velasquez and you even... Uh, you know, be one of uh, a guy I used to like a lot, uh, uh, Antonio Diaz, who you, you even got a, the Ring Magazine knockout of the year in 2003 over. You know, it was a spectacular knockout that you had there. And people were starting to say, like, hey, this guy's for reals, man. I mean, you know, at that point, you know, what, what was it like, you know, to know that you were getting up to this top-notch level and you were, you were going towards that way and you were kind of holding – you know, your spot as being a real fighter, a real Olympian fighter, a real guy that, that's, you know, lived up to this name and becoming a top-notch fighter. What was that like for you? It was good. I mean, I knew I was capable of being a champion. I mean, that was the dream that I had as a young kid. You know, that was actually my, more of my dream than making the Olympic team, was to become world champion. Once I took up the sport of boxing, I always wanted to become a world champion. I didn't think about making the Olympics. That wasn't my dream. Being world champion was my dream turn pro, become world champion. When I had wins over, you know, Guti Espadas, where I knocked him out in two rounds, everybody had, oh my God, Rocky, he's, he's serious. He can become world champion. And I remember leading up to uh, my first title shot at, at, at featherweight, I was supposed to fight Engine Chi. And two weeks prior to the fight, something happened. You know, I don't remember what call what happened, but they took him out. He couldn't fight. So then who was ranked number two? Humberto Soto. And I never knew of Humberto Soto because, I mean, I always did my homework. You know, I think a fighter, to become the best, you have to do your homework, man, you know. And I always did my homework. I always kept up with all the fighters, and I studied boxing. And when they told me, you're not going to fight for the world championship, but would you be interested in fighting Humberto Soto for the uh, WBC interim title? I'm like, interim title? What the, what, what the hell is an inter interim title? Well, it puts you in line. If you win, your next fight will be for the world title. I said, why is that? If I'm, I was supposed to fight for the world title in two weeks, why am I going to have to go backwards now and beat this guy just to get another shot at a world title? So I was very upset, but at the time, you know, you, two weeks before a fight, I was training for a 12-round fight. I had already been in training for so long. I just wanted to fight. 
I knew I, w- I could beat him. So I was very confident going into that fight, you know, leading up to that fight when I was supposed to fight in Jinchi. I knew I could fight him inside and, and I could also fight him on the outside. So when they replaced Kim Jin Chi for uh, Humberto Soto, which I had agreed on, I, I believe I had lost a little spark because I was supposed to be fighting for my first world title. I remember a lot of people were downing you because you, you had fought uh, another Olympian uh, from the 96s, uh, Zahir Rahim, in, in your in your hometown. And a lot of people thought that Rahim had had won. And so a lot of right. people were saying, okay, well, Kim Jin Chin just came off of a good fight with uh, Eric Morales, the chin might just walk all over what Rocky what is. And I, I remember them, uh, you know, a lot of people thinking that as well. Yeah. I mean, when I, when I fought Zahir Rahim, it was crazy because I, I, it was just me. Like, he never hurt me. You know, I think his hardest shot he caught me with in that fight was a jab, was a pretty good solid jab. And throughout that whole fight, the guy never hurt me. You know, he was holding. I had him going back the majority of the whole fight. But, you know, don't get me wrong, Zahir Rahim was a very slick fighter. He threw a lot of punches. He was very slick, and you know, but I don't know. I mean, that's that, that, that's part of the sport. You go on, man, and instead of that becoming a setback in a way, it made you go up against you know these other fighters, which later on brought you to a fight with Marco Antonio Barrero, man, uh, WBC fight, and I was there at the Staples Center in LA to watch that fight, <laughs> and you pretty much quieted everybody in there because everybody thought it was going to be a, a Barrero victory for sure uh, with ease. And, uh, you know, you get a fight like that. What was it like, man, when you got that news that you were going to fight this legendary Mexican fighter, but you were going to have to come to L.A. to fight him? You know, what was it like for, for you, man, to get that news that, gonna, that you got up to this notch to fight a guy like Barrera? Uh, I remember I was at the gym, and my coach called me to his office, and he said, Hey, Rocky, you just got a call from main events, and uh, they asked me if you would be interested in fighting uh, Marco Antonio Barrera. Man, I, at first, man, I thought, I thought my coach was bullshit, and I said, Barrera. He's like, yeah, Barrera. I said, like, man, stop saying. He's like, I'm serious. You have to fight him at 130 pounds. And, you know, I had fought my whole, my whole career at 126 at that time, leading up to that fight. And I was like, uh, I said, hell yeah. I mean, I remember having a big old smile on my face. Big old smile on my face because I was just thinking to myself, man, I'm going to fight Barrera. At the same time, I was afraid too, you know, scared, nervous. But, any fighter who wants to be the best has to fight the best. And I think with my credentials from the Olympics, I always something I always told myself, you know, never doubt myself, you know. Always always believe in myself and my ability to, to go out there and perform and, and be better than these guys who are even better than me. So I knew Barrera had his credentials, you could say. You know, he had beat the best. He was the best. He was the man at that time in the featherweight division. Um, I was happy. When, I, when they uh, they offered me that fight, it was a great feeling. What is it like in the locker room, man? When when uh, you're in the locker room with these with these fighters, that they know you're an Olympian, and probably before they became pro, they probably try to get there at one time. But of course, not everybody gets there except those certain people. You know, uh, are are you seen like a target already because you're an Olympian? I mean, do people kind of treat you like you know different because? You know, maybe you have a lot of haters because you, you made it that far because you get that recognition on top of you that to be an Olympian and they might hate on you for that reason. Do, do you feel a little bit of that with your, you know, fellow boxers? Do you feel that sometimes with them? No, you know, I, I'm a very humble person. I mean, I don't, I, it's just crazy how, to me, people are like that. But I can say that people weren't like that with me, you know, whether they, whether they didn't like me or they, they were haters, you know, let them hate. You know, just as long as they don't disrespect me. That's the way I see it. Always- Absolutely. And I think I ask you because you, you see these gold medalists, like let's say De La Hoya. Everybody doesn't like them because they get paid more, you know, on, in their pro debuts or, you know, early on in their careers. And right. they just get hated on right off the bat. I guess I was just asking to see if you felt a lot of that, you know, during this trip, you know, up to, you know, when you got to fights like with guys like Barrera. Well, no, I mean, I think... uh you know, when they gave me the shot with Barrera, they did look at me as a uh, an opponent, I believe, as uh, another win for Barrera. But uh, I think I, I definitely showed a lot of the critics and the non-believers that, oh, shit, Rocky, he, he's for real. You know, he just gave Barrera a beating, you know. They they gave Barrera the decision. Even when they announced the fight a draw uh, at the time, people saw that I was for real. You know, I knew I could have beat Barrera, you know, and that's something that I was very upset at myself after the fight. 
because it's the story of my life, man. It's just, why didn't I just throw more? I think if I had thrown more, I would have probably been able to stop her at that time. I would have been world champion. But you know what, to say that, that you were proud of yourself is, I, I would say, you know, I don't know if you're just being very humble or something, but we were there. Okay, now Barrera was a big highlight in L.A. boxing. He used to fight at the Forum all the time. He used to fight here in L.A. all the time. So he was kind of a staple here. This is where he started his, his big rounds here. So I remember going there with all of my friends. You know, there was about 20 of us. We were all saying Barrera's going to win this easy. And when we all left, we left there quiet. You know, nobody was, you know, really celebrating. So obviously you did something right. So I don't know, I don't know if uh, it was so much that you did anything wrong, uh, Rocky, at the same time. Well, you know, I was just happy. I was just happy that I was able to go against 12 rounds with one of the best. That's the way I was seeing it at the time. You know, it was until about 15 minutes after the fight when we were in our dressing rooms and I still had my trunks on and I was sitting down that one of the commissioners of California Boxing came in and said that uh, there was a miscalculation in the scorecards and that one of the judges uh, miscalculated the scorecards and they had Barrera winning by a point. You know, at that, that time when, that, when they told us that, my manager at the time, Shelly Finkel, Oh, he got pissed. He, he, I mean, he, he got pissed. Where, as for me, I kind of just took it. I just like, I took it and rolled with it. I just said, oh, whatever. I don't care. Shit. I just fought the best, you know? I'm that's, that's right. I forgot there was a reversal. It was a draw, and then they reversed it to, to, to him getting that, that uh, edge there. Yeah, nobody even knew. When I got home, people still thought it was a draw, unless you, unless you, uh, were on the computers and you read up on it you would find out that I had lost by a single point. Nobody, even when I came back home, still felt that the fight was a draw, declared a draw. And it was me that had to tell them, like, no, nah, they miscalculated the scorecards, and, you know, they had me losing by a point. So uh, I lost. I lost. I didn't win. Almost four months later, you got the rematch, and you knew that, uh, you know, whatever that you did, you know, you were just going to have to improve a little bit or so. But, you know, were you doing anything different into that training for that second fight, for that rematch? Was there something that you were, did you have some kind of plan there for? My plan was to knock Barrera out, to go in and throw punches. But Barrero's plan was to box, and that's what he did. And he moved a lot, and he boxed. I mean, the second fight, he did win. You know, he did outbox me. But I messed up because I didn't go in thinking that he would do that. You know, I thought he was actually going to fight me because Barrero's always been known for one of those Mexican fighters to go out and, and trade with his opponents. So in some way, I was looking forward to trading with him, and he didn't do it. I remember at that fight, he uh, there was a guy at the airport when I was when I was going home to Houston, coming home. One of these Mexican guys at the airport, he came up to me and he said, "Hey, Rocky, you know, in Spanish, he goes, you know, keep your head up. You know, Barrera lost a lot of respect from me. You know, we went there thinking that, you know, he was going to go in there and give you a school lesson, take you to school, but all he did was just run." That's not how Mexican fighters fight, and he had lost he lost all my respect in that fight. Yeah, and he did so. He got that victory as well. You fight two more times, and on your third fight up from that, you fight another legend match, Juan Manuel Marquez, who's still you know dominant in the sport today, and you fight him over in Tucson, Arizona, man. What was it like to know that you were going to be fighting this other Mexican legend and in Arizona where there's a uh, big population of uh, Mexicanos over there. What was that like uh, to, to get that oh, man, news? Same, same thing. You know, I think Barrera was more more exciting for me because I was young. I was younger, and that was my first uh, big-name fighter, you could say. And that, I mean, to me, Guti Estadas was even a big name when I fought him at the time. But, you know, Barrera's a whole different he, – he's in a whole different category. And he was a lot uh, closer to your style as well. Yeah. So Marquez, when they told me to fight Marquez, I mean, I was very excited as well, but – you know, that fight, you know, it just, I went in there thinking I was going to be able to box him and, and win, you know, and, you know, it just didn't turn out my way that, that day. And a very interesting fight that you fight after that is uh, Jorge Barrios, who I remember I used to like watch a lot fight, and uh, you knocked him out in the 11th round. What was that a fight oh, like man, for Barrios. you? Oh, Barrios, man, he was one of the, I can say he's one of the hardest punches I fought in my career, one of the hardest hitters in my in my uh, 40 fight career. Really, even I'm over uh, Barrera? Oh, yeah, he hit harder than Barrera. Barrera didn't hurt me one time. You know, Barrera was more of a uh, speed fighter. He had a good jab. I remember Barrera having a good jab. But Barrera didn't really have that much power, you know. Uh, Barrios, he was a heavy-handed fighter. He was slower than Barrera, but when he hit you, you could feel it. You know, whether he hit you in the elbow or in the arms, he was heavy-handed. What was it like when you finally got him down, man? Were you just like, I'm glad this is over? Or, you know, did you want to keep going at that time? Well, you know, I was... 
Like, I didn't feel like I was losing, man. I don't think he was landing. I knew he was throwing a lot of punches. But I don't feel like he was landing a lot of shots. I remember he caught me with a, uh, a left hook. I had my glove up, but his left hook happened to just hit me in, in, a, in a certain spot on my, my right eye bone. And it just swelled up. And I remember he hurt me. He had hurt me with that punch, but I was able to uh, recover pretty fast and continue. Wasn't there a few low blows in that fight as well? Yeah, we we both had a couple few low blows, I think. <laughs> and that was uh, there in your hometown, Houston, Texas. The next fight up, man, another tough guy that I think one of the most underrated fighters, man, Chris John. And you fought him in Houston, Texas. The fight after that, you know, you got to draw there with them. And you know, Barrett, or I'm sorry, Marquez, you know, had a tough time with them too, man. You know, what was that fight like with uh, Chris John? Well, Chris John, man, I tell, uh, he was very, he was very wiry. You know, wiry. What I mean by wiry, he was one of those type of fighters that he, he was very durable, very durable. I would hit him to the body, and I could hear him uh, uh, making these noises, hitting him to the head. I mean, I hit him more than I could say than Barrios, and he took him. And I know I hurt him at times, but he kept throwing. That goddamn Indonesian boy, he was tough. He was tough. You know, he wasn't the hardest hitter, but he, he had enough power to get some respect. You know, the first fight, he cut me, I believe. And I remember yeah. that was like one of the first and only fights I could think of that all three judges had it 114-114. Like, all of them had it a, a, a draw. Uh, yeah, well, I don't know. I don't know. I don't, I don't know what the judges' scorecards were, but he was tough. You know, he was very wiry, very... uh. uh Sneaky, I guess. He was just one of those fighters that he threw punches from every angle. He had good head movement. He had he was just very durable as well. Yeah, very crafty veteran. Um, crafty, crafty. You you go up and you fight him again uh, in Vegas. Uh, he gets a victory on that one. Was he a little harder because he might have adapted to your style in that first fight? Was he a little harder to fight on that second fight? No. You know what? Actually, I thought I hurt him more in the second fight. It was, that's what's crazy. The, the second fight, I, you know, I haven't, it's been, a, it's been a while since I've, I've seen the fights. But I remember after the second fight when we fought in Vegas, man, I had him out. Like, he was, he was hurt. You know, and I think that's why it took him so long to actually fight again. He never really came back to the States after the second fight we had to fight again. I remember, uh, during the press conference, he was lost. When I say by lost, he was, uh, he wasn't all there, you know. He was pretty beating up at the second fight. He was more beating up the second fight than he was the first fight. The first fight, I was more beaten up. You know, I think he uh, he had cut me. I was swollen in the face. But in our second fight, he was more swollen, and, and I was clean in the face. In September 2008, when you fought Barrios, you got that, that great knockout victory over him. That was one of your, your last wins until your last fight, which was in 2012, where you got a, another uh, knockout win. But that was like four years that you hadn't got a victory. A lot of people were thinking that you were down, you were out, you were probably going to retire from boxing, man. And it's 2014 now. But is Rocky Juana still in the mix of boxing at the moment? And I, yes, I am. I mean, that's why I wanted to have this interview. Because, uh, you know, I've been in the gym. I've been training, you know, venturing out and doing other things now. Because at my age, you know, I need to. You know, I've invested my money pretty well. so. Um, I'm hoping to have my own gym, you know, train kids, keep them out of the neighborhood, keep them out of the streets, and uh, hopefully do something, in, in, you know, as a trainer, maybe. Would you ever, like, go back in that ring and, and fight again oh, professionally? Yeah, oh, I definitely want to get back in, into it, you know. I've been sparring, you know, it's been about three months since I've sparred, but I've, I train every day. I, my weight is only about 10 pounds from uh, the 130-pound weight division. Not even 10 pounds. You know, the other day I weighed out at 137, and, and that's not even me running yet. So that's just off gym work, gym work. Your second to your last fight there, one of my fellow guys here from Oxnard, a fighter from here that I support very much, his name is Hugo Centeno. He fought on that card there in Indio, California, where you fought uh, Andrew Cancio, and you guys had a great uh, fight that day. A few a few days later, I interviewed Carlos Famoso Hernandez, and I know you asked me something about him the other day. But, uh, oh, you yeah. know, I, I talked to, uh, and I had asked him about the guy from Oxnard, what he thought of his performance. And then I asked him about your performance on what he thought of, of your fight. And he said, you know, uh, he goes, I don't know if uh, he's going to come back, but, uh, you know, I, I think he still has that toughness in him to come back. So, you know, obviously he saw something there. And, you know, after that, a few months later, you had that fight where you win by knockout. So I've been hoping, man, to, to hear something of you, 
you know, since that fight in, in October of 2012. But I haven't really heard anything from you to see if you were going to come back, man, and show what you still got. Well, you know, I, I, last year, uh, 2013, I had three fights canceled on me. I was supposed to fight J.O. Thompson from uh, Mexico in Cancun on the undercard of uh, Shane Mosley when he, I believe he fought Cano. They caught, you know, we signed contracts and everything, you know. I had already signed a contract, I had already sent the contract, and two weeks before the fight, they told me, hey, Rocky, you know, the fight is off. I said, what do you mean the fight's off? Um, is the uh, country not fighting? Is the whole card knocked off? They're like, nah, just, just you. You know, everybody's still fighting, just you're not fighting. You know, they changed opponents. And I'm like, what the hell, man? You know, there's a lot of fights going on in Texas now. Even Mikey Garcia, you know, one of our guys, is going to Texas a lot and fighting. Pacquiao's fought in Texas in the last uh, few years, you know. A couple of times, Julio Cesar Chavez Jr. just fought in Texas last weekend. You know, there's all these, I mean, Texas is just blowing up. It's becoming like the new Nevada over there, you know, and, and this is your time to capitalize, man, and I really hope you take advantage of this situation. Well, you know, I, I definitely want to fight again, you know, but I'm not going to be fighting for uh, for, for peanuts either, you know. I mean, you know, I'm going in there every fight, putting my life on risk. You do that every fight, but, I mean, I think something that people don't understand is if they're not going to be able to compare or, or, or match what I made my last fight, then, like, I don't even want to talk. You know, it's, that's just how I see it. If they can't compare or, or match what I made my last fight, which it wasn't even much, you know what I mean? Then I don't, I don't even care to talk. And then also it's just the opponent, too, as well. I mean, if I'm going to fight, I can't get up for a kid who's 16 and 0 with 12 knockouts or 15, 14 knockouts unless he's going to better me and put me in the spot. For, for something even bigger, you know. I know I'm going to be used as an opponent. That I'm okay with. You know, I've been okay with it for the last few years, but I just don't see myself just taking a fight just to take a fight just for the money because I don't need the money. And you know what? You got you got every right, Rocky, to, to say that and to think that because your style is just it's fan-friendly. You know, it's, it's what we go to see. You leave it all in the ring. Every time I see you fight, man, whether you win, lose, draw, whatever the heck, you know, you've always left it all in there, man. And, you know, it, it's always the best fight of the night, you know, whether you be on the undercard or the main event, you know, you, you leave it all in there. That's how I see you, man. Every time I've thought of, of you, I've always said you were like the, the best fight. You were the action of the, of the night. And you never let us down, man. And, and what can I say except that, you know? Yeah, I appreciate that, man. Even though you're going to be around in 100 years from now, man, and how do you want people to remember Rocky Juarez once it's all said and done? How do you want people to think of you every time they think of that name, Rocky Juarez? Well, unless I win a world title, you know, I, I mean, I can say that I'm not going to be a Mayweather, that's for damn sure. I'm, I'm, I might not even be, well, I'm not going to be a Barrero or even a Marquez, but one thing I would probably, I would want the fans, and, and 100 years from now, if my name was to ever come up, I just want them to say, that was one tough motherfucker. You can I, say I, it, man. It's, it's, it's called the boxingbar.com, so bar language is, is appropriate here, man. So oh, you can okay. say it all yeah, you want. That was, <laughs> that was one tough motherfucker. If you ain't, let's just say my kids tell their grandkids, and, you know, just like you said, 100 years from now, I want them to be able to say that, you know, he went in there and he fought with, all, he fought with heart. He didn't lay down for nobody and wasn't afraid of anybody. Man, I, I really hope we get to see you again soon, man. Like I said, it. You always leave it all in the ring, man, and, and there's no hating on that. That's what we're here for. That's why boxing still continues, and that's why we watch every weekend, every step that these fighters, like yourself or anybody else, makes, you know, because we expect that, and only someone like Rocky Waters will leave it all in the ring. Thank you very much, man, for coming on to the boxingbar.com finally, man, and, and letting us know what you're about. And hopefully down the line, man, when a, or a fight arises, you know, let us know what's going on and, you know, hopefully we can get a, a few thoughts on, uh, uh, on your coming fights and, you know, whatever you're doing in the future, brother. Well, shit, man, I appreciate everything. I uh, appreciate the interview, but, you know, keep me in mind, you know, if somebody ever talks, if they need a 126, 130-pounder, Hey, throw my name out there in the mix and just say, hey, you know, Rocky Water, he's still fighting. It's just, you know, he just ain't fought, you know. Not because he don't want to fight, it's just, you know, what are you offering on the table. And remember, man, I'm from Oxford and we have a bunch of 126ers here and 130s. So, you know, remember, I I know the Mexican Russian, man, he's a, he's a champion at 126 and I'm going to throw your oh, name yeah, out I would, there. I would love to fight him too. <laughs> oh, yeah. Fight hey, him. hey, he's a champion and he's, what, 16, 17 and 0 now? And he's waiting for that tough opponent, man, and only someone like you could bring out his style as well, man. 
Oh, yeah, you know, that would be a fight right there. I saw him fight the other day. Yeah, uh, okay, yeah, well, yeah, you know yeah, what? Yeah. On that note, man, I'm going to talk to to Jenny. Uh, probably in two weeks he's going to come on, and uh, we're going to have a chat. So, you know, I'm going to throw your name out there and see what he thinks of, you know, find a guy like you, man, and hopefully Robert and his guys will, are listening, man, and, you know, are willing to throw down with that with that bet, man. Shit, we, that fight can happen. I'd be, I'd be glad for that fight to happen. Yeah, that'd be a good fight, man. I appreciate it. Hey, thanks for the interview, and uh, you have a good night. You do the same. Thank you very much, Cap. You have some nice wins, man, against guys like Hector Velasquez, and you even, uh, you know, be one of uh, a guy I used to like a lot, uh, uh, Antonio Diaz, who you even got a, the Ring Magazine knockout of the year in 2003 over. You know, it was a spectacular knockout that you had there. And people were starting to say, like, hey, this guy's for reals, man. I mean, you know, at that point, you know, what, what was it like, you know, to know that you were getting up to this top-notch level and you were, you were going towards that way and you were kind of holding – you know, your spot as being a real fighter, a real Olympian fighter, a real guy that, that, you know, lived up to this name and becoming a top-notch fighter. What was that like for you? It was good. I mean, I knew I was capable of being a champion. I mean, that was the dream that I had as a young kid. You know, that was actually my, more of my dream than making the Olympic team, was to become world champion. Once I took up the sport of boxing, I always wanted to become a world champion. I didn't think about making the Olympics. That wasn't my dream. Being world champion was my dream turn pro, become world champion. When I had wins over, you know, Guti Espadas, where I knocked him out in two rounds, everybody had, oh my God, like, Rocky, he's, he's serious. He can become world champion. And I remember leading up to uh, my first title shot at, at, at featherweight, I was supposed to fight Engine Chi. And two weeks prior to the fight, something happened. You know, I don't remember what call what happened, but they took him out. He couldn't fight. So then who was ranked number two? Humberto Soto. And I never knew who, of Humberto Soto. Because, I mean, I always did my homework. You know, I think a fighter, to become the best, you have to do your homework, man, you know. And I always did my homework. I always kept up with all the fighters, and I studied boxing. And when they told me, you're not going to fight for the world championship, but would you be interested in fighting Humberto Soto for the uh, WBC interim title? I'm like, interim title? What the, what, what the hell is an inter interim title? Well, it puts you in line. If you win, your next fight will be for the world title. I said, why is that? If I'm, I was supposed to fight for the world title in two weeks, why am I going to have to go backwards now and beat this guy just to get another shot at a world title? So I was very upset, but at the time, you know, two weeks before a fight, I was training for a 12-round fight. I had already been in training for so long. I just wanted to fight. I knew I, w I could beat him. So I was very confident going into that fight, you know, leading up to that fight when I was supposed to fight in GG. I knew I could fight him inside, and, and I could also fight him on the outside. So when they replaced Injin Chi for uh, Humberto Soto, which I had agreed on, I, I believe I had lost a little spark because I was supposed to be fighting for my first world title. I remember a lot of people were downing you because you, you had fought uh, another Olympian uh, from the 96s, uh, Zahir Rahim, in, in your in your hometown. And a lot of people thought that Rahim had, had won. And so a lot right. of people were saying, okay, well, Injin Chi just came off of a good fight with uh, Eric Morales, the chin might just walk all over what Rocky what is. And I, I remember then, uh, you know, a lot of people thinking that as well. Yeah. I mean, when I, when I fought Zahir Rahim, it was crazy because I, I, it was just to me, like, he never hurt me. You know, I think his hardest shot he caught me with in that fight was a jab, was a pretty good solid jab. And throughout that whole fight, the guy never hurt me. You know, he was holding. I had him going back the majority of the whole fight. But, you know, don't get me wrong, Zahir Rahim was a very slick fighter threw a lot of punches, he was very slick, and, you know, but I don't know, I mean, that's that, that, that's part of the sport. You go on, man, and instead of that becoming a setback, in a way, it made you go up against, you know, these other fighters, which later on brought you to a fight with Marco Antonio Barrero, man, uh, WBC fight, and I was there at the Staples Center in LA to watch that fight, <laughs> and you pretty much quieted everybody in there, because everybody thought it was going to be a, a Barrero victory, for sure, uh, with ease. And, uh, you know, you get a fight like that. What was it like, man, when you got that news that you were going to fight this legendary Mexican fighter, but you were going to have to come to L.A. to fight him, which is pretty much uh, still Mexico. <laughs> you know, what was it like for, for you, man, to get that news that, gonna, that you got up to this notch to fight a guy like Barrera? Well, you know, I didn't think of it like that. You know, fighting in California, it being somewhat like Mexico. But uh, I remember I was at the gym, and my coach called me to his office, and he said, hey, Rocky, I just got a call from main events, and uh, they asked me if you would be interested in fighting uh, 
Marco Antonio Barrera. Man, I, at first, man, I was, I thought my coach was bullshit. And I said, Barrera? He's like, yeah, Barrera. I said, man, stop saying. He's like, I'm serious. You have to fight him at 130 pounds. And, you know, I had fought my whole, my whole career at 126 at that time, leading up to that fight. And I was like, uh, I said, hell yeah. I mean, I remember having a big old smile on my face. Big old smile on my face because I was just thinking to myself, man, I'm going to fight Barrera. At the same time, I was afraid too, you know, scared, nervous. But any fighter who wants to be the best has to fight the best. And I think with my credentials from the Olympics, I always, something I always told myself, you know, never doubt myself, you know, always, always believe in myself and my ability to, to go out there and perform and, and be better than these guys who are even better than me. So I knew Barrera had his credentials, you could say, you know, he had beat the best. He was the best. He was the man at that time in the featherweight division. Um, I was happy when, I, when they uh, they offered me that fight. It was a great feeling. And you know what, man? Before I ask the next question about Barrera or anybody after that, man, um, what is it like in the locker room, man? When when uh, you're in the locker room with these with these fighters that they know you're an Olympian, and probably before they became pro, they probably tried to get there at one time. But of course, not everybody gets there except those certain people, you know, are, are you seen like a target already because you're an Olympian? I mean, do people kind of treat you like, you know, different because, you know, maybe you have a lot of haters because you, you made it that far because you get that recognition on top of you that to be an Olympian and they might hate on you for that reason. Do, do you feel a little bit of that with your, you know, fellow boxers? Do you feel that sometimes with them? No, you know, I, I'm a very humble person. I mean, I don't, I, it's just crazy how, to me, People are like that, but I can say that people weren't like that with me, you know. Whether they whether they didn't like me or they they were haters, you know, let them hate, you know, just as long as they don't disrespect me. That's the way I see it. People I, absolutely, and I think I ask you because you you see these gold medalists like let's say De La Hoya, and they just get bashed after a while because they're like everybody doesn't like them because they get paid more you know, on, in the pro debuts or, you know, early on in their careers, and right. they just get hated on right off the bat. I guess I was just asking to see if you felt a lot of that, you know, during this trip, you know, up to, you know, when you got to fights like with guys like Barrera. Well, no, I mean, I think, uh, you know, when they gave me the shot with Barrera, they did look at me as a uh, an opponent, I believe, as uh, another win for Barrera. But uh, I think I, I definitely showed a lot of the critics and the non-believers that, Oh shit, Rocky, he, he's for real. You know, he just gave Barrera a beating, you know. They, they gave Barrera the decision, even when they announced the fight a draw, uh, at the time, people saw that I was for real. You know, I knew I could have beat Barrera, you know, and that's something that I was very upset at myself after the fight, because it's the story of my life, man. It just, why didn't I just throw more? I think if I had thrown more, I would have probably been able to stop Barrera at that time. I would have been world champion. But you know what, to say that, that you were proud of yourself is, I, I would say, you know, I don't know if you're just being very humble or something, but we were there. Okay, now Barrera was a big highlight in L.A. boxing. He used to fight at the Forum all the time. He used to fight here in L.A. all the time. So he was kind of a staple here. This is where he started his, his big rounds here. So I remember going there with all of my friends. You know, there was about 20 of us. We were all saying Barrera's going to win this easy. And when we all left, we left there quiet. You know, nobody was, you know, really celebrating. So obviously you did something right. So I don't know. I don't know if uh, it was so much that you did anything wrong, uh, Rocky. At the same time, well, you know, I was just happy. I was just happy that I was able to go against twelve rounds with one of the best. That's the way I was seeing it at the time. You know, it was until about fifteen minutes after the fight when we were in our dressing rooms and I still had my trunks on and I was sitting down that one of the commissioners of California Boxing came in and said that uh, there was a miscalculation in the scorecards and that one of the judges. Uh, miscalculated the scorecards and they had Barrera winning by a point. You know, at that that time when that when they told us that my manager at the time, Shelly Finkel, oh he got pissed. He he I mean he, he got pissed where as for me, I kinda just took it. I just like I took it and rolled with it. I just said, Oh, whatever. I don't care. Shit. I just fought the best, you know? I'm that that's right. I forgot the there best. was a reverse, so it was a draw and then they reversed it to to, to him getting that, that uh, edge there. Yeah, nobody even knew. When I got home, people still thought it was a draw, unless you, unless you uh, were on the computers and you read up on it, you would find out that I had lost by a single point. 
nobody even when I came back home still felt that the fight was a draw, declared a draw. And it was me that had to tell them, like, no, nah, they miscalculated the scorecards and, you know, they had me losing by a point. So, uh, I lost. I lost. I didn't win. Almost four months later, you got the rematch and you knew that, uh, you know, whatever that you did, you know, you were just going to have to improve a little bit or so. But, you know, were you doing anything different into that training for that second fight for that rematch? Was there something that you were, did you have some kind of plan there for? My plan was to knock Barrera out, to go in and throw punches. But Barrero's plan was to box, and that's what he did. And he moved a lot, and he boxed. I mean, the second fight, he did win. You know, he did outbox me. But I messed up because I didn't go in thinking that he would do that. You know, I thought he was actually going to fight me because Barrero's always been known for one of those Mexican fighters to go out and, and trade with his opponents. So in some way, I was looking forward to trading with him, and he didn't do it. I remember at that fight, he uh, there was a guy at the airport when I was when I was going home to Houston, coming home. One of these Mexican guys at the airport, he came up to me and he said, "Hey, Rocky, you know, in Spanish, he goes, you know, keep your head up, you know." Barrera lost a lot of respect from me, you know. We went there thinking that, you know, he was going to go in there and give you a school lesson, take you to school, but all he did was just run. That's not how Mexican fighters fight, and he had lost he lost all my respect in that fight. Yeah, and he did so. He got that victory as well. You fight two more times, and on your third fight up from that, you fight another legend match, Juan Manuel Marquez, who's still, you know, dominant in the sport today. And you fight him over in Tucson, Arizona, man. What was it like to know that you were going to be fighting this other Mexican legend and in Arizona where there's a big population of uh, Mexicanos over there? What was that like uh, to, to get that oh, news? Same, same thing. You know, I think Barrero was more, more exciting for me because I was young. I was younger, and that was my first uh, big-name fighter, you could say. And that, I mean, to me, Guti Estados was even a big name when I fought him at the time. But, you know, Barrero is a whole different he, – he's in a whole different category. And he was a lot closer to your style as well. Yeah. So Marquez, when they told me to fight Marquez, I mean, I was very excited as well. But, you know, that fight, you know, it just, I went in there thinking I was going to be able to box him and, and win, you know. And, you know, it just didn't turn out my way that, that day. And a very interesting fight that you fight after that is uh, Jorge Barrios, who I remember I used to like watching a lot fight. And uh, you knocked him out of the 11th round. What was that a fight oh, like man, for Barrios. you? Oh, Barrios, man. He was one of the, I can say he's one of the harder punches I fought in my career. One of the hardest hitters in my in my uh, 40 fight career. Really? Yeah. Even over uh, Barrera? Oh, yeah. He hit harder than Barrera. Barrera didn't hurt me one time. You know, Barrera was more of a uh, speed fighter. He had a good jab. I remember Barrera having a good jab. But Barrera didn't really have that much power, you know. Uh, Barrios, he was a heavy handed fighter. He was slower than Barrera, but. When he hit you, you could feel it. You know, whether he hit you in the elbow or in the arms, he was heavy-handed. What was it like when you finally got him down, man? Were you just like, I'm glad this is over? Or, you know, did you want to keep going at that time? Well, you know, I was, like, I didn't feel like I was losing, man. I don't think he was landing. I knew he was throwing a lot of punches. But I don't feel like he was landing a lot of shots. I remember he caught me with a, uh, a left hook. I had my glove up, but his left hook happened to just hit me in, in, a, in a certain spot on my, my right eye bone. And it just swelled up. And I remember he hurt me. He had hurt me with that punch, but I was able to uh, recover pretty fast and continue. Wasn't there a few low blows in that fight as well? Yeah, we we both had a couple few low blows, I think. <laughs> and that was uh, there in your hometown, Houston, Texas. The next fight up, man, another tough guy that I think one of the most underrated fighters, man, Chris John. And you fought him in Houston, Texas. The fight after that, you know, you got a draw there with him. And, you know, Barrera, or, I'm sorry, Marquez, you know, had a tough time with him too, man. You know, what was that fight like with uh, Chris John? Well, Chris John, man, I thought, uh, he was very he was very wiry. You know, wiry, what I mean by wiry, he was one of those type of fighters that he he was very durable, very durable. I would hit him to the body and I could hear him uh, uh, making these noises, hitting him to the head. I mean, I hit him more than I could say than Barrios. And he took him. And I know I hurt him at times. But he kept on. That goddamn Indonesian boy, he was tough. He was tough. You know, he wasn't the hardest hitter, but he, he had enough power to get some respect. You know, the first fight, he cut me, I believe. And I remember yeah. that was like one of the first and only fights I could think of that all three judges had it 114-114. Like all of them had it a, a draw. Uh, yeah, well... I don't know. I don't know. I don't, I don't know what the judges' scorecards were, but he was tough. You know, he was very wiry, very uh, uh, sneaky. I guess he was just one of those fighters that he threw punches from every angle, 
he had good head movement. He had he was just very durable as well. Yeah, very crafty veteran. Um, crafty. crafty. You you go up and you fight him again uh, in, in Vegas. Uh, he gets a victory on that one. Was he a little harder because he might have adapted to your style in that first fight? Was he a little harder to fight on that second fight? No. You know what? Actually, I thought I hurt him more in the second fight. It was, that's just crazy. The, the second fight, I, you know, I haven't, it's, been a, it's been a while since I've, I've seen the fights. But I remember after the second fight when we fought in Vegas, man, I had him out. Like, he was he was hurt. You know, I think that's why it took him so long to actually fight again. He never really came back to the States after the second fight we had to fight again. I remember uh, during the press conference, he was lost. When I say by law, she was uh he wasn't all there, you know. He was pretty beating up at the second fight. He was more beating up the second fight than he was the first fight. The first fight I was more beating up, you know. I think he uh, he had cut me. I was swollen in the face, but in our second fight, he was more swollen and and I was clean in the face. In September 2008, when you fought Barrios, you got that that great knockout victory over him. That was one of your your last wins until your last fight, which was in 2012, where you got a, another uh, knockout win. But that was like four years that you hadn't got a victory. A lot of people were thinking that you were down, you were out, you were probably going to retire from boxing, man. And it's 2014 now. But is Rocky Juarez still in the mix of boxing at the moment? And I, yes, I am. I mean, that's why I wanted to have this interview because uh, you know I've been in the gym, I've been training. You know, venturing out and doing other things now because at my age, you know, I need to. You know, I've invested my money pretty well. So um, I'm hoping to have my own gym, you know, train kids, keep them out of the neighborhood, keep them out of the streets, and uh, hopefully do something, in, in, you know, as a trainer, maybe. Would you ever, like, go back in that ring and, and fight again oh, professionally? Yeah, oh, I definitely want to get back in, into it, you know. I've been sparring, you know, it's been about three months since I've sparred, but I've I train every day. I, my weight is only about 10 pounds from uh, the 130-pound weight division, not even 10 pounds. You know, the other day I weighed out at 137, and, and that's not even me running yet. So that's just off gym work, gym work. Your second to your last fight there, one of my fellow guys here from Oxnard, a fighter from here that I support very much, his name is Hugo Centeno. He fought on that card there in Indio, California, where you fought uh, Andrew Cancio, and you guys had a great uh, fight that day. A few a few days later, I interviewed Carlos Famoso Hernandez, and I know you asked me something about him the other day. But, um, oh, you yeah. know, I, I talked to uh and I had asked him about the guy from Oxnard, what he thought of his performance. And then I asked him about your performance on what he thought of, of your fight. And he said, you know, uh, he goes, I don't know if uh, he's going to come back, but, uh, you know, I, I think he still has that toughness in him to come back. So, you know, obviously he saw something there. And, you know, after that, a few months later, you had that fight where you win by knockout. So I've been hoping, man, to, to hear something of you, you know, since that fight in, in October of 2012. But I haven't really heard anything from you to see if you were going to come back, man, and show what you still got. Well, you know, I, I, last year, uh, 2013, I had three fights canceled on me. I was supposed to fight Yayo Thompson from uh, Mexico in Cancun on the undercard of uh, Shane Mosley when he, I believe he fought Cano. They caught, you know, we signed contracts and everything, you know. I had already signed a contract, I had already sent the contract, and two weeks before the fight, they told me, hey, Rocky, you know, the fight is off. I said, what do you mean the fight's off? Um, is uh, Kanchi not fighting? Is the whole card knocked off? They're like, nah, just just you. You know, everybody's still fighting, just you're not fighting. You know, they changed opponents. And I'm like, what the hell, man? I think my question is, you know, there's a lot of fights going on in Texas now. Even Mikey Garcia, you know, one of our guys, is going to Texas a lot and fighting. Pacquiao's fought in Texas in the last uh, few years, you know, a couple of times. Julio Cesar Chavez Jr. just fought in Texas last weekend. You know, there's all these, I mean, Texas is just blowing up. It's becoming like the new Nevada over there, you know, and, and this is your time to capitalize, man, and I really hope you take advantage of this situation. Well, you know, I, I definitely want to fight again, you know, but I'm not going to be fighting for, uh, for, for peanuts either, you know. I mean, you know, I'm going in there every fight, putting my life on risk. You do that every fight, but I mean, I think something that people don't understand is if they're not going to be able to compare or 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 match what I made my last fight, then like I don't even want to talk. You know, it's, that's just how I see it. If they can't compare or or match what I made my last fight, which it wasn't even much, you know what I mean? Then I don't, I don't even care to talk. And then also it's just the opponent too as well. I mean, if I'm going to fight, I can't get up for a kid who's 
16 and 0 with 12 knockouts or 14 knockouts, unless he's gonna better me and put me in the spot for for something even bigger. You know, I know I'm gonna be used as an opponent. That I'm okay with. You know, I've been okay with it for the last few years, but I just don't see myself just taking a fight just to take a fight just for the money because I don't need the money. You know what? You got you got every right, Rocky, to, to say that and to think that because your style is just it's fan friendly. You know, it's it's what we go to see. You leave it all in the ring. Every time I see you fight, man, whether you win, lose, draw, whatever the heck, you know, you've always left it all in there, man. And you know, it, it's always the best fight of the night. You know, whether you be on the undercard or the main event, you know, you you leave it all in there. That's how I see you, man. Every time I've thought of of you, I've always said. You were like the the best fight. You were the action of the, of the night, and you never let us down, man. And, and what can I say except that you know? Yeah, I appreciate that, man. Even though you're gonna be around in a hundred years from now, man. And how do you want people to remember Rocky Waters once it's all said and done? How do you want people to think of you every time they think of that name, Rocky Waters? Well, unless I win a world title, you know, I, I mean, I can say that. I'm not going to be a Mayweather, that's for damn sure. I'm, I'm, I might not even be, well, I'm not going to be a Barrero or even a Marquez, but one thing I would probably, I would want the fans and, and a hundred years from now, if my name was to ever come up, I just want them to say, that was one tough mother, motherfucker. You can I, say it, man. It's, it's called the boxingbar.com, so bar language is, is appropriate here, man. So oh, you can okay. say it all yeah, you want. Well, that was one tough motherfucker. If you ain't, Let's just say my kids tell their grandkids and, you know, just like you said, a hundred years from now, I want them to be able to say that, you know, he went in there and he fought with all, he fought with heart. He didn't lay down for nobody and wasn't afraid of anybody. Man, I, I really hope we get to see you again soon, man. Like I said, it, you always leave it all in the ring, man, and, and there's no hating on that. That's what we're here for. That's why boxing still continues, and that's why we watch every weekend, every step that these fighters, like yourself or anybody else, makes, you know, because we expect that, and only someone like Rocky Waters will leave it all in the ring. Thank you very much, man, for coming out to the boxingbar.com finally, man, and, and letting us know what you're about. And hopefully down the line, man, when a, or a fight arises, you know, let us know what's going on. And, you know, hopefully we can get a, a few thoughts on, uh, uh, on your coming fights and, you know, whatever you're doing in the future, brother. Oh, well, shit, man. I appreciate everything. I uh, appreciate the interview. But, you know, keep me in mind, you know, if somebody ever talks, if they need a 126, 130-pounder, Hey, throw my name out there in the mix and just say, hey, you know, Rocky Waters, he's still fighting. It's just, you know, he just ain't fought, you know. Not because he don't want to fight, it's just, you know, what you're offering on the table. And remember, man, out from Oxford, we have a bunch of 126ers here and 130s. So, you know, remember, I I know the Mexican-Russian, man, he's a he's a champion at 126, and I'm going to throw your oh, name yeah, out I would, there. I would love to fight him, too. <laughs> oh, yeah. Hey, him. hey, he's a champion, and he's, what, 16, 17, and 0 now? And he's waiting for that tough opponent, man, and only someone like you could bring out his style as well, man. Oh, yeah, you know that would be a fight right there. I saw him fight the other day. Yeah, uh, okay, yeah, well, you know what? Uh, on that note, man, I'm going to talk to to Jenny. Uh, probably in two weeks he's going to come on, and uh, we're going to have a chat. So, you know, I'm going to throw your name out there and see what he thinks of, you know, find a guy like you, man, and hopefully Robert and his guys are, are listening, man, and, you know, are willing to throw down with that with that bet, man. Shit, we, that fight can happen. I'd be, I'd be glad for that fight to happen. Yeah, that'd be a good fight, man. I appreciate it. Hey, thanks for the interview, and uh, you have a good night. You do the same. Thank you very much for